I thought everybody had left before my talk, but it was good to see some of you come back. Um, yeah, as Adrian said, I've just been, um, as an amateur really, researching the, what well, I see, the 800-year history of Salisbury Marketplace. Um, and it's been interesting actually just listening to a couple of other comments about the market, so maybe as I go through I can um, put my slant on that as well. My view, to begin with, um, is that the marketplace was without doubt the most uh, crucial element in Bishop's relocation project, um, the success of which totally depended on a thriving market. Um, it was, in my view, an economic project in essence. Um, and of course it uh, became one of the most successful uh, markets in the whole of the kingdom in the later Middle Ages. Um, but the story doesn't really end there for me. Um, I'm going to go through 800 years and I think no matter what period of time you look at, um, it's always been the most important uh, plot of land in the city. Um, I know archaeologists disagree because they think that's the wind of Mars, but um, <laughs> in my view it's the most important plot in the city. <laughs> um, Marketplaces, of course, uh, always had great economic significance for towns and for their uh, hinterlands, um, but they often had wide-ranging um, social significance too. Um, they had multiple functions and they drew people in from um, all sort, for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I think from early, early marketplaces were, were very much a manifest, manifestation of authority, they were very regulated places, but their roles uh, evolved over time. Um, but at the, throughout that period, the marketplace is the most important. So, with that in mind, marketplace evolving multifunctional context, I'll, uh, I'll go through the talk. That's a very outdated model of OSERA, but um, somebody told me that they thought the, uh, the little bit up there was um, supposed to be the marketplace. Um, what I would say is uh, that we should start at Oaksera Market if we could find it. And I don't think we actually know for sure where the market or the marketplace um, was. I know there's been lots of geophysical um, survey up there, uh, work up there, so I'll talk about that um, on the next slide. Um, but we do know there was a functioning market at Oaksera at the time of the Bishop's relocation. And we know more than that, and this is where I'm going to possibly disagree with with some of the things that have been said, um, because uh, there were complaints that the Sarum market was disadvantaged by unfair practices at horrible New Sarum as late as 1275. Now, if we take that as red, then that means that the Sarum market was still operating in some way um, at, at that stage. That wouldn't be just a few people hanging on, that would be the next generation, the generation after that. Um, however, it came from the people of Wilton, so whether they were using Oaksera and Market um, in a way that to support their own case, they were being disadvantaged, um, we don't know. But I'm going to take it as read that there was something still happening out there. Um, well, there was certainly still lots going on in Oaksera after the bishop had gone. Um, we know, I think in the mid-13th century, the castle was still continuously garrisoned, supplied with food and provisions. Sheriff's officials were up there to an administrative centre of jail for the county. So back to the geophysical um, survey results, the thing that I found most interesting was the um, long open piece of ground just inside the Oak Bailey. Um, to me, that would be great for some more archaeological investigation because I think that's the most likely place at some stage um, for a market. Um, but perhaps by the 1220s and beyond, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, it was in it was in the North Fort at all. Um, it might have operated uh, outside the North Fort, possibly. Um, uh, just trying to find my place, but um, certainly some of outside the Hill Fort, there are possible areas of ground which might be used as a market near Castle Road. They'd certainly be more accessible to pass and trade, which might be needed because greater numbers of people deserted the site. But I guess the only way what I've found out is, uh, is if we get more archaeology up there, um, so I'll leave that to the experts. But I do believe that uh, it should be seriously considered because I've never really seen much comment about the market. Uh, <coughs> 
I don't know quite exactly, I had to use a sort of um, purple pound loan pen. Um, whatever, <laughs> whatever remained at uh, O Serum, um, the size of the plot, which I had marked with that purple pen, um, for the marketplace at New Serum, um, it was enormous. It, it made a real um, statement. I hear the um, comments about the early marketplace, I think there could have well been some early market activity around St Thomas, got no problem about that. Um, but I think St Thomas's was actually um, over at what's, St Thomas's was over on the western side and I think it was very much part of that very early massive set out market area. Um, on the eastern side as well um, um, you have the Guild Hall, certainly by 1300, but I am wondering whether there might have been something under this um, before, before that Guild Hall. Um, so at either side of the massive marketplace um, area, we have the church, and we have the Guild Hall, the Eye of God and the authority of bishops were ever present. The original sighting um, of the marketplace took advantage of the flat open ground, obviously, a ready water supply from the River Avon, uh, water was sent through hatches above the Fisherton Bridge into channels around three sides of the marketplace. Um, and a much deeper channel, we've heard about that, the town ditch, um, with faster flowing water, uh, was regulated by a hatch below, below the bridge. And that, I agree, defined the whole southern boundary of the marketplace. Um, I believe the channel, actually, the town ditch, was probably intended as a potential uh, flood defence for the market area, um, but also as a means of uh, waste disposal for uh, market activity. Um, in terms of flood risk, which um, I'm not sure if everybody would agree with me, but we can look at evidence from much, much later council minutes. Um, in 1800, a great torrent, uh, again, a great current of water damaged bridge and stonework in the New Canal. And Victorian councillors uh, discussed the fact that the new canal regularly flooded in the early 19th century. So it sort of supports the idea that that was a, a flood defence of some form. Uh, water flow could be very fast. Um, this is shown by a man falling in the tank ditch. It was dark, it was that night in um, 1805. He fell to his, he was swept away to his death. Um, I, I think that's probably caused by the hatch in the, um, in the, into the town ditch being defective or even missing. Uh, from the 17th century, responsibility for looking after that hatch fell to the occupier of the King's Head Inn, um, as it, is, it was in the, uh, in the yard of the inn. Um, but many landlords completely ignored that duty um, to the frustration of the, of the city authorities. I'm sure that the current um, occupiers of that um, in the Weatherspoons, and uh, we've not done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one I've just put up quickly because it shows the importance of the King's Head Hatch. Um, it's on the border house map of 1860. Uh, so water would have come down through to the right there of the hatch, word, um, through the yard, turned right underneath the high street surface channel and along New Canal. What is now the New Canal? I was searching for a picture of a butcher's school and I came up with this one. Um, the early marketplace was very regulated. I've said that traders of different types of produce were placed in different parts of the market. Um, around, by around 1300, a uh, market cross was in place, suggesting a very highly organised market authority. Um, and we can take butchers and fishmongers as an example of uh, market organisation. Uh, the city ledger informs us that out of town butcher stores were located near the market cross initially, which might sort of tie in with that old poultry. Uh, but in 1404, they were moved nearer the town ditch behind the city butchers, who were already located in prime position along uh, what's known as Butcher Road. And in 1427, the out-of-town fishmongers were also moved next to the town ditch, behind the stores of the city fishmongers in Fish Road. So out-of-town traders uh, were presumably separated to, to make it easier uh, for the authorities to uh, supervise them, I should think. More use of the pen. Um, if we just zoom in on the, on the original plan, um, it's not certain where um, around the market cross, which would have been here, 
um, the Agitone butchers moved from, but it seems that once they moved, we could have had, well, in my view, we could have had two or three rows there of butchers in red, a couple of rows of, uh, of, of fishmongers in blue. And, and I believe from the way they're described in the ledger that they would have taken up much of that uh, southern part of the original marketplace area. At least for a period of time anyway, it's really difficult sometimes to, to understand whether they're just being moved temporarily or whether, whether that's a longer term thing. Uh, the top row in each, as I've said, is the, um, are the, are the city traders. Um, and the intention, again, I think I've, I'm repeating myself, but the intention of having them all down there on the, on the southern part of the marketplace was that waste disposal activities could more easily take place. Um, into the into the fast flowing town ditch. I'm not expecting you to read this. Um, for <laughs> for the first, if you can read, you've got a problem. Go to spec um, For the first 250 years, um, all rents for the market um, went to the bishop. The bishop just took all the money. Um, but by 1480, the city assembly negotiated to keep the proceeds from the out of town bridges schools. Um, when new stores were erected for them. And we can follow rentals for the butcher's stores, um, where butcher standings is down there, um, in the Chamberlain's accounts, right through to 1683, uh, when they were finally pulled down. Um, the annual rentals remained at 10 shillings throughout almost all that period, which seems incredible to me when you think of council rent reviews today. Um, but when all 30 stores were rented out, obviously that brought in 15, 15 pounds to the city. Um, always an interest one of the butchers, like the other, like other storeholders, sometimes um, got into difficulty. They have difficult times to endure, obviously, in, uh, in times past. During the plague outbreak here in 1666, I came across something that I think was a city furlough scheme. Um, the accounts, I really do. Um, the accounts show normal receipts, ten shillings each, coming in for twenty-eight stalls um, that year. But the occupiers of twenty-two received the rebate back um, as the plague hit. So I'm pretty sure that's sort of the furthest thing. And I've got further evidence um, in a minute. Going in on these ones, there is a lot of um, family continuity on the Ocean Town butcher stalls. Um, of the 30 names in 1660, uh, 15 were still operating 20 years later. People like um, William Blathwaite, uh, Edward Penny, um, and other stores were, were passed on to family members or, or widows. We've got James Pepperell uh, as a widow there. Um, some stores have passed, um, so, sorry, so, uh, so family traders coming in from the hinterland, um, they had a long relationship, this family relationship with the market. And an idea of what the stores looked like when they were sold off in the 1680s can also be gleaned from these accounts. For tiles and timber, dismounted standings, uh, the city received an average of um, about six, six shillings a store, I uh, worked out. So these were, they're not like modern stores where they go up and down on market day, they're probably taking them down there now as we speak. Um, they were fairly sort of permanent features for a few years. But it was the wool trade that really transformed New Zealand into uh, one of the greatest uh, market centres in the kingdom. Uh, records show that the, the wool market was over on the east side of the marketplace from a very early stage. Uh, overlooking the wool market, rich merchants were um, building their large properties um, by the early 14th century. Um, this one, number nine, uh, behind the 18th century facade, has got some great medieval timber work, um, and that was the uh, that was the base for William Russell. He purchased that uh, plot in 1306, so really quite early. By the end of the 14th century, Salisbury um, rose to become one of the, the great sort of major cloth manufacturing and marketing centres. Um, and it would have been in the marketplace here, opposite these um, houses, that huge quantities of cloth were traded. And as other research has shown, um, at this time when Wiltshire was uh, such a major national player, uh, almost 90% of the county's cloth, the whole of the cloth in the county, was traded in and around that marketplace. 
as the market became busier, um, more areas were regulated, we, um, the livestock trade, uh, trading, which I haven't mentioned, was moved out by the early 15th, possibly earlier. Um, a new cheese cross went into the um, northwest corner um, for dairy and fruit, and uh, a wall cross was erected on this side of the, of the marketplace. Um, Salisbury's location was everything really. Its medieval market was within a day's loaded cart ride um, from the port of Southampton, one of the most important ports um, in the south of England, and it was also perfectly uh, located really for Wiltshire wool and cloth traders who sold their produce here um, for onward export through Southampton. In return for that, uh, raw materials such as woad and, and madder arrived via uh, Salisbury for distribution um, to the woolen industry. So it would have come here as a redistribution centre and gone out. Um, and whilst dealing with only a part of the overall trade happening here, the port brokerage books, which have been mentioned earlier, of Southampton, um, show that more parts travelled to Salisbury than anywhere else outside London in the 15th century. Uh, famous uh, Salisbury merchants all appear in the brokerage books John Hall, William Swain, John Hall. If you're from Salisbury, you know those names. Um, they were the ones who built the grand houses around the marketplace. They dealt in a range of projects, nobody specialised in any one thing. But they would have had high quality shops around the marketplace as well. But goods were also traded by um, merchants from other towns around the country. So we would have had goods coming into Salisbury for, for instance, Robert E. of Bruton in Somerset, John Clark of Exeter. They seem to have a relationship with Salisbury Market, which um, is an interesting one. So they were, they were big merchants in their own towns, but they were also making money in Salisbury. I don't think I can, I, I can think it's one would work. Um, the University of Winchester's published a uh, database for 14 47, 48, um, enabled us to, I mean, if you could read it, you could, you could see that every, every journey with the date down the left hand side, you can see what they were transporting and you can see the name of the carter. Um, and in the final column, I've just marked up if the merchants were um, from somewhere outside Salisbury. So actually, quite a lot of those um, rows, the goods coming into Salisbury are for people who are not Salisbury people. Um, where I've marked G in the final column, um, um, that's where there's a group of carts coming in, so I'm not talking about um, this guy, John Hillier. So this shows all the journeys of John Hillier. He would have either come on his own with his cart, or would have come in a, a sort of convoy. There are 28 trips on there over an eight-month uh, period. Um, Elizabeth Lewis uh, once calculated a return trip from Southampton back again to here and back would take two days, so it's within the day's cart ride, overnight rest for the horses, back again the next day. And I'd support that view, um, most of the trips I've looked at, but there are two trips um, up here, um, we've got him doing one on Thursday the 9th and then another one on Friday the 10th, and one down here somewhere is um, 21st and 22nd of February. So you've got him coming to Salisbury on two consecutive days. I don't know how he managed that. Um, one option, of course, is that they were Hillier carts. He owned the carts and somebody else was driving them. But the number of Hillier journeys, to me, doesn't really um, support that because these are, I mean, there's not many more journeys in that, in that time period. He was going to, you know, occasionally to Romsey and to, to Andover and places, but there weren't that many journeys. Or did he race back on a fresh horse and then come back the next day? Or, you know, did he hitch a bit of another carrier and then come back the next day? We don't, we don't know. Um, and of course, the carts from Southampton were only part of the story. Um, carts would have come from many, many places. Um, there was a very good east-west road through Salisbury. And goods would also arrive um, here by boat along the, along the river valleys, um, too, just depending on the, on, on the goods and the produce, I guess. Um, the number of carts coming into the city caused uh, lots of traffic jams, congestion, damage to roads, bridges uh, across the channels and such like. It was a constant in the, in the uh, town, the council accounts, the repairs to all these things. I'm pretty sure carts were banging into market crosses and, and all sorts as well. Um, 
And it was the citizens, the leading citizens in the form of the city assembly that uh, regulated such matches. The location for civic government um, has always been right here in the marketplace as well. Um, most of their meetings took place in the Bishop's Field Hall. Um, this one obviously is when it was being, this, this uh, particular place is when it was being demolished. But in the early 15th century, the city leaders also acquired a, 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 their own council house um, over in the cheese market, backing onto St. Thomas's uh, churchyards, and they had some of their meetings there. Uh, minutes give a lot of detailed information about the running of the marketplace, keeping the water channels clear, um, market cross repairs and such like. And they did deal with the traffic issues as well. In 1416, it was ordered that horses coming into the city uh, must not stand around in the market after unloading. The courts, um, if you go through the court records, um, they ruled on many cases of roads and, and uh, throughways being blocked all the time. They also um, dealt with national laws on illegal market activity. Um, in 1417, John Barham was charged with uh, buying a malt to sell on for a profit. That was completely no no, that was forbidden. And in the same year, John Lawrence was a judge to a woven cloth with a wrong warp. And all that was burned in public view in the marketplace. I'm going to fast forward to the Elizabethan. Um, in the 1580s, a new council house appeared. I think you saw part of that earlier archaeologically. Um, and this was on the site of the sort of declining wool market by this time. And clearly that was a major encroachment on the open marketplace area. Um, but it signalled, I think, um, the rise of the importance of the council um, under the Elizabethans. Um, Wakes and measures, by the way, were, um, were uh, closely supervised and the common way beam um, and scales were housed in a room underneath the, underneath the council house. <coughs> Uh, weighing duties were released out. Uh, 20, um, James Russell and then Anne Russell paid £28 a year um, for the right to, to weigh people's um, and goods and they make a profit from that. Uh, and that was from the yeah, 1660s to 1680s. And it was James, I, this was another backup for my furlough scheme because James also seems to have been on furlough in 1666. He only paid half of the, um, he only had paid half of the rent for the year. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, another thing about the marketplace, I'm going to steam, I should have started, so I'm going to do a high speed journey run the way through the major reviews. Um, proclamations were always um, um, carried out in the marketplace as well. Um, this was when, um, basically, it was the venue for announcing major news stories. If you wanted to know what the news was in the day, royal births, deaths, coronations, declarations of war, that sort of thing come to the marketplace and you'll probably be already here. It was, um, and proclamations were always accompanied by an unbelievably great ceremony. Um, the, the city's mayor and the councillors would exit the council house uh, in procession in their robes. They might be accompanied by drums and trumpets depending on the uh, occasion. Um, and the proclamations in Salisbury were always carried out so they would stop at a number of places and they stopped in five places in Salisbury, and four of those places were right in the marketplace, where most people were. Um, they stopped underneath the council house, they stopped in the middle of the open marketplace, they stopped at the cheese market, and they stopped at the poultry cross. So I think another example of how important the marketplace was for the life of um, people in Salisbury. And the fifth location um, was on the corner of um, High Street and New Street outside my house today. Uh, that's also Salisbury Marketplace. It was also um, the centre for uh, of law and order. All cases were heard in the New Serum Courts and the Marketplace, heard by the Mayor, local jurors being uh, businessmen. Um, and the punishments obviously visited out in days past uh, here in public, full public view from the Middle Ages right through to the 19th century. Uh, the stocks, the pillory, the whipping post, they were all there. Uh, punishments could be uh, pretty severe for women as well as men. Mary Harvey, convicted of uh, stealing articles from a shopkeeper in 1747, she was sentenced to be whipped at the cart's tail all the way around the, the marketplace. 
Um, and we've got another one in like 1808, I've got a guy going and being, being paraded around the, the monarchy. So it's, you know, pretty much um, pretty recent, really. The Wiccans themselves, this is quite a good one, they were carried out by the city beadles. Um, and they, they were paid for each Wiccan. Um, <laughs> Um, and that's all listed in those Chamberlain's accounts. So I've worked out that um, they received fourpence for every whipping at first, quite a lot of years, and then they got a pay rise, six pence a whipping. Some years, no whipping, some very, a lot of whipping, so I did quite well out of those years. The Victorians pulled down these uh, articles of torture um, in 1845, seeing it as an embarrassing reminder of times past. But whipping has continued under the Victorians, of course, just behind the uh, um, the, the gates of the jails. And in the museum, you can, um, just around the corner, you can see the part of the old pillory that came down from um, Salisbury Marketplace. By the look of it, you could fit two people in side by side, nice and snug. <laughs> um, the marketplace trip changed from authoritarian venue to a uh, high class shopping district in an instant. Um, it was the place to be seen to, uh, if you have money, even uh, early merchants, of course, which we talked about, had their, um, had their shops around, around the marketplace. But by the 17th and 18th centuries, Salisbury had become um, quite a well-known cutlery centre for its quality, if not its uh, quantity, and it was all locally made. Um, the most successful cutlery businesses, again, attracted to um, the marketplace. And it was certainly the case for the guards, James and uh, Thomas Goddard were based in Queen Street, um, echoing times past when the most successful medieval merchants uh, lived there. And the Goddards were, were clearly very proud to advertise that they were cutlers too. Uh, that was uh, George III of the royal family. Um, I think this photo belongs to the museum. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, Victorian photograph of um, 1863, so a very early one. Um, but why I wanted to put this up, because basically the marketplace by this stage could have looked very different indeed. Um, the Elizabethan Council House um, down here has burned down in 1780, so the marketplace is, is very open again um, all the way through. Uh, that council house, along with the Bishop's Guild Hall, were demolished um, just about together, really. Um, and there were initial calls to replace it with a building uh, right in the centre of the marketplace. So, um, 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 luckily for us, the council has turned that recommendation down. Um, and so we have the Guild Hall now off, off, on, um, off to the side here, where it is today. Another building which might have ended up right in the middle of the marketplace is um, the Market Hall over here, the Market House, um, built just a few years before this photograph was taken. Um, a railway line, as we've heard, transported goods directly into that Market Hall from the Fisherton main line. Um, but the initial plans were that that line would come right out into the marketplace with the building. So again, that would have been quite a, a change to what you, you see today. But it seems that, you know, despite these calls for these sorts of things to be happening, the Victorians of Salisbury at least um, saw the open marketplace as sacrosanct. They, they didn't want to lose this space. And um, I've been mulling over all sorts of reasons why it's still there today in the fashion as it is, but um, I, I've not got time to go through them, but um, you can probably think of a few yourselves. Um, the buildings around the marketplace at this stage um, are full of uh, local, long-standing, successful family businesses. You've still got uh, Nisha and Cutler here, a survivor. Leach, the family grocer, has been there for 50 years. From 18, well, from 1820 to 1870, I think that one was there. The original um, Wilkes and Dorset Bank over here is quite a small little building um, before the grounds of the Lodge Bank building. Um, we see today. It's two later extensions. So first of all, we have the first part of the new Lord, what we see now as the Lord's Bank building built, um, and over uh, two extensions from that, um, we lost Knight the grocer and we lost Blake the printer. So the Lord's Bank today takes up that whole space. 
style the grocer, sorry, style the draper here um, is the predecessor to a big department store that was here to, until the 70s, uh, style the gra garish. Um, yes, women were here as well. Um, we have uh, Louisa Cooper's corset and women's wear shop. And the chemist on the end, uh, which I think is incorrectly marked by whoever uh, annotated this in the museum, um, because it, they weren't there at this stage. Um, but the, the chemist shops were um, in the marketplace in that building for um, over 200 years, starting with Robert Square in 1807 and moving through to Lloyd's, um, which just moved, you know, modern day Lloyd's chemist, which moved there not, not long ago. And the open marketplace as well um, is taking on a new life. Um, this is a statue of uh, Sidney Herbert, just been erected. Um, this space was becoming a place of commemoration and celebration. Herbert was a local man, uh, Secretary of State for War in the Crimean War, responsible for sending Florence Nightingale um, out there. And I'm going to flash through quite a lot of them, very slight, very quickly now, just to show you what the marketplace transformed itself into. Um, this is the unveiling of the Sydney Herbert uh, statue. Look at this, uh, stands erected outside the, the, the council house. Um, and it's now showing the marketplace in a new light. A great place of celebration. Um, if you thought that was a celebration, well, I um, guess this was the Crimean um, Peace Festival just a few years before that, in 1856, before the, uh, before the market and house has been erected. Um, and this really was the start, I'd say, of a new era. Tables laid out right across the marketplace. Um, to see lots of Salisbury citizens. Uh, it was the precursor to many such events um, right through the Victorian period and into the early 20th century. It became a very public space. That's one of the. Oh, that's good because um, that's a photograph of the 1887 um, Queen Victoria Golden Jubilee. Um, around 3,600 men sat down to dinner. All the women followed afterwards um, for their afternoon tea. Um, Jubilee celebrations were, the Jubilee celebrations in Salisbury, unbelievably, were reported to be the third largest in the whole country. Probably because of the size of the, the enormous size of the marketplace. Um, and just a few fun facts about this everyone paid a shilling, but they all had to bring their own knife and fork. Um, and there were 400 carvers. Can't just spot a car, but there are, there are plenty out there. Um, and they also had to bring their own carving knife and fork as well, all despite the fact that Salisbury used to have a fantastic cutlery centre to do with it. Um, it was the local businessmen and women around these marketplace shops here who raised the money and organised these great events. And when I said something about um, Wills and Dorset Bank and Lloyd's Bank, um, that was um, the original uh, Wills and Dorset Bank being rebuilt. Um, and you see, you count the windows here, uh, five, that was the original, and then three more got added before this date in the 1860s. Um, and the next three, White Oak Lake here. So we've now got a building, if you look at it today, uh, sorry, two more out here, it's got now ten windows. So it's, it took Blake out um, in the 1901 extension. Huh. Uh. That's a slightly anxious looking Jubilee Ox, <laughs> um, which was uh, enjoyed by people in the marketplace in 1887, apologies to vegetarians. That's the ladies' tea. Um, this is a, uh, a photo of uh, Armistice Day, uh, 11th of November 1918. True People's Space now. The War Memorial, of course, was um, later erected around here. Um, so it's now the, the marketplace, it's now the place people come to pay their respects to those who, who've lost their lives as well. This was uh, a World War One peace uh, parade, um, so returning soldiers after the, after the war. It was used as a military parade around on occasions like this. Um, but it was also the space over many, many centuries where families would have waved goodbye, uh, from Agincourt to, to World War II. I've got some great, um, I was reading some minutes about Henry, the, um, people here under Henry VI who were being sent off to France and uh, um, they, they lined up in the marketplace as well. So uh, something else, there's continuity. Um, the marketplace of course continues to operate as a market on Tuesdays and Saturdays throughout. Here's the weekly Tuesday livestock market in the early 1900s. 
Um, it continued like this right through to the 1950s until it was moved out to new premises um, more conducive to um, 20th century animal welfare standards, I guess. Um, postcards are very helpful on eBank. Um, this is very early 20th century. Lots of carts, which I like to see. You sort of think back to all those days of medieval carters coming in. So it's still a very busy place, but the market's never as profitable, obviously, as, as in its medieval heyday. Um, but it's still going. And it's still going today. Uh, this was a photo I just took, I think, shortly after um, lockdown in 2021, just beginning to, to get our normal lives back. Um, so I think, you know, um, the marketplace has moved from being sort of an authority, a very, very economic, very regulated, very authoritarian place to, um, to one which I think people enjoy just wandering around, taking a coffee and such like. And just as I was saying that it's no longer an authoritarian, regulated marketplace, <laughs> as I was walking through the other day, I, I, uh, I took that. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you.